This is your faithful host, James, and I'm so excited to be talking to today's author, Mr. Gerald Clark. And uh, we're going to be discussing Gerald's work, uh, The Anunnaki of Nibiru, Mankind's Forgotten Creators, Enslavers, Destroyers, Saviors, and Hidden Architects of the New World Order. And uh, Gerald is a mechanical engineer, and I just love having fellow engineers on the show to discuss uh, ancient history. I, I seem to be collecting a lot of these authors on the show, and people can refer to the archives for the for the other shows. And, and um, this is what brings merit to the show. And uh, Gerald's going to get into a little bit about his career and, and how he got into this wonderful subject himself. So I don't want to ruin the biography. And uh, so without further ado, let's bring on our guest. Hi, Gerald. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Capricorn Radio. Hi, James. It's uh, really great to be here, and I want to wish a warm welcome to all your listeners. Oh, thank you, brother. Thank you. And like I said in the intro, we've got a mechanical engineer. Well, actually, I'm an electrical engineer. So. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> I do electromechanical. I don't distinguish between the two. Uh, no. Gerald, sorry, you're an electrical engineer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, and you got into some wonderful uh, breakdown uh, in the book, um, which is why I think your book about the Anunnaki is so different to most out there. And, and, and you know, I think a lot of people have took Sitchin's work and, and carried the flag and kept going and, you know, looked into all the texts and stuff, uh, Gerald, and you've applied an engineering and, str- and scientific discipline to this, um, too, Gerald, as well. And that's what gives you body and, and a difference to the other people out there. Um, before we get into the book, Gerald, uh, let's tell me about you, the author, and tell me about Gerald, the engineer, how you got into this subject. There's a bit of a turnaround from your career. Uh, is this a hobby? Have you always been into history? What was the catalyst that got you into this subject, Gerald? Uh, it's a good question. I've told this version of the story multiple times. I actually never really realized that Part of my influence and my drive to figure out the state of the world happened when I was 14. And I was in the front yard of uh, my uh, kind of remote farm in the northwest corner of Arkansas. And and we were about, I don't know, 12 12 miles north of where Walmart started. Actually, that's where we lived, if you know where that that is in the country. Anyway, uh, a little little unknown fact there. I was standing out in the yard kicking a ball up in a, a walnut tree. About 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 five or five thirty p.m. It was real calm. Usually, you know, at the end of the day when the sun's starting to chill out, uh, the thermals have stopped and the and it's very still. Uh, one of my favorite times. But anyway, I'm kicking a ball up in the tree trying to knock walnuts down. And suddenly, uh, something caught my attention just to my right in a little cow field just across this dirt road where we live. And a, a silver disc at about 100 feet off the ground was just hovering, coming north to south very slowly, not even five miles an hour, very slow. And I thought, oh, my gosh, whatever that is. You know, my, my primal instinct, I was a pitcher in baseball, is to pick up a rock and throw it at me. And I thought, no, I don't think that's a good idea. And I just sat and watched it. And then I ran the house, grabbed my mom. We went on the back porch and watched as it flew over our garden, right over our cow pasture, and then back over the wooded area in the back of our house. It was just rolling hills covered with trees. And it looked it looks like broccoli in the summer when it's when all the trees are in bloom, but at this time this time of the year it was actually uh, some, it was somewhat later in the year. But we just watched this thing fly close to the tops of the trees, and it was following the contour of the trees, kind of like in the, in later in, in my life. And I'll tell you that part in a minute. I became a helicopter pilot. And we call that nap of the earth. You know how he was flying. So didn't think much about it. But and I really never thought about the encounter. I was so close. I mean, probably only. 60 feet away and, it, and I, you know so i thought well and i told my mom i said well maybe it was a, a, a an advanced military craft that is working with fort chaffee down near little rock and that's the direction it was heading and i never thought about it again i i didn't i had never heard of a ufo we were you know this was this was uh quite a quite a number of years ago i won't date myself anyway so that that had some influence that i really never recognized until much later in my life when i got into this so Interestingly enough, when I was in engineering at UCSD studying, uh, I first started out as a computer engineer, and then I got my graduate degree in electrical engineering. Mm-hmm. And so as an undergrad, I had an interest in, uh, in all things artificial intelligence because I worked at an AI company for seven years. And we did lots of uh, research into how the brain works, how to write computer models of the brain, how to do situation assessment, how to do sensor fusion, and apply what we do in complex situations as humans to try to teach machines to do this. You know? in, wow. retro- in retrospect, it doesn't sound like a very good idea, does it? 
So during that that exposure to artificial intelligence, I learned about a couple of things, and, and and they really interested me because I had an interest in uh, evolution, just the evolution of man. I, I was a truth seeker in a sense, you know, and I was I was watching. Australopithecus, Africanus, the famous Lucy artifacts that showed up in the San Diego Natural History Museum. And I definitely went to see that because I, I had read about this. I was like, wow, could this, could this be our missing link? You know, I was way back at the time where people were still recovering from the, the false missing link fiascos that have gone down, like Pilt pit Down Man and all the other things that have happened in the past. But this one looked interesting because, uh, you know, there were real bones that you could check out. So I had an interest in evolution. And while I was in college, having been exposed to artificial intelligence and genetic algorithms and and all the things that go with, uh, I don't know, the the various disciplines in AI, one of them was data mining that you would turn into expert system rules. So you'd capture a rule set from an individual that could then be turned into software code that could model how a human acts. So it's a rule-based system, not a if-then system, you know, that's, even though it's they're similar. but Imagine a microprocessor firing off when it gets a rule satisfied or multiple rules satisfied at the same time that then causes the fetch decode execute cycle. Well, you know, this is what we were doing and this is what humans do. So anyway, with that exposure, while I was at UCSD, I got heavily involved in doing research into evolutionary hardware, causing hardware to adapt itself to its inputs because of the reconfigurable parts that you can get now, right? So I was always kind of interested in this, this the, the, the theory of evolution. And what I discovered in my grad school work was that, and this ought to be obvious to the most casual observer now, is that evolution is not a good solution for applying to real-time problems. Ev evolution takes iterations and time for it yeah. to get right. Now with a computer, you can do things much faster, but in biological systems, it doesn't, it doesn't happen quickly. And this is where I got confused, because what I discovered was there wouldn't be any possible way for any life to still be on this planet given the catastrophes that have occurred and the vast temperature changes that have occurred for animals that are sensitive to temperature, like reptiles, that they could have survived. Because some of these catastrophes lasted for years and tens of years, maybe even hundreds. <laughs> you know, so how could a creature s survive in an instantaneous temperature change? You know, how, how is this possible? Well... Later in my research, I discovered that, that environmental stressors seem to have the ability to cause DNA to change and adapt to real-time stressors. For, for an instance, there was some research done on a chicken egg recently. And through the embryonic stages, and now they haven't applied this to stages beyond the embryo, but to my knowledge, maybe they have. But during the embryonic stages, you can in introduce certain chemicals that would represent an environmental stressors could have a real-time impact as well. So I, I mentioned a, a, a chicken egg was under research recently, and as they added stressors to it while it was in its uh, embryonic state, in cer inject injecting certain chemicals to represent certain stressors that would have happened to the chicken, they were able to cause the DNA of this embryo to produce features that went way back in the chicken's history, even having feet that look like a dinosaur, and, te and teeth as well. And I thought, wow, that's, that's interesting. This kind of uh, makes me rethink my evolutionary theory that, mu that genetic um, mutations don't only happen at, the, at, at birth. You know, th th that's how it's modeled. Is there some deformity and the environment supports it uh, it's chosen in the life function determined to propagate that that feature and then everybody else has it pretty soon everyone that doesn't dies that's usually well that that takes time that's generational for that to happen okay and as we just mentioned if the temperature changed overnight they'd have to adapt immediately or, or they'd be gone so uh, another example of genetics changing real time uh, consider a uh, uh, your pink uh, pig in a barnyard you know when they're when they're kept in a safe environment and fed whether they don't have to forage and all you know they they you know look like porky the pig <laughs> but you put one of those out in the wild and force it to survive and next thing you know it goes feral so the environmental stressors change and the biological constructs of that pig will change too so that, that really kind of made me start thinking about, well, does that apply to humans too? Could we be exposed to stressors such that our DNA changed? So it, it planted a seed in my mind that I go, I was carrying forward for a long time. So uh, it, it, to supplement that, I studied Quartronic Networks in grad school that models how the human brain could be modeled in software. 
including bidirectional associative memory and the whole thing. And uh, it really made me realize at that point in time, and this is 98, I would say, we truly understood the human brain and how it worked, and we could model it in software. So the idea of putting that as a rule set into a robot was really quite frightening. And now if you look at Japan and the United States and the UK have done with robotic technology, it's quite, quite amazing. Um, go look up Titan the Robot <laughs> just for a laugh on YouTube and see as, as this thing is touring the world. It's, it's kind of scary, scary, actually. <laughs> so, so how did evolutionary um, aspirations lead to the Anunnaki? Everybody else would be wondering that. Well, you know, I, I was interested in the truth of human origins. Uh, and, you know, looking at evolution, and all, you know, I realized that we, we truly did not know or we were being lied to, one or the other. And academia was not the place to find the answer. So anyway, make a long story short, I was uh, traveling as an executive in telecom, um, doing some patent work with uh, some folks over in Turkey. And they were going after the telecom market, and we had a technology that we were helping them with through, at a company I was working at. And while I was there, I got exposed to their culture. I was there for several times, trying not to be an ugly American. I tried to learn a little bit about their culture, as they knew a lot about ours, because a couple of them had been educated in America. So we were out at dinner one night and uh, talking, and they had taken me to a place called uh, what they called their Mount Olympus in Bursa, Inigal, Turkey. And it just so happened it was the headquarters of where the Byzantine Empire was destroyed by the Ottomans, and Ataturk got, became famous at that site. So there was, there was some real history going on there, and they, and they were dropping a few historical bombs on me that completely violated my understanding of our chronology that was taught in school. It usually starts in Greece sure. and goes forward. You know, they definitely aren't talking about uh, yeah. Egypt very much or or Samaria yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, one thing led to another, and I was reading this book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, where it was talking about a few places in Turkey that were much older than what I believed was the oldest civilization we had found. And I, you know, of course, I was focused on Egypt. Everybody thought about Egypt being at 3100 BCE was was the oldest, and you know, and I never really, I wasn't never a historian. I was an engineer. I wasn't really that interested. But this, this something that happened there that really caught my interest in that uh, some of the symbols on the mosque really drew me in. I was like, well, what do those mean? You know, <laughs> as an engineer, I'm curious. You know, these three descending orbs, a crescent moon, and, and the architectural structure of the mosque is quite amazing anyway to have something that looks like a UFO and rockets surrounding it. <laughs> it's really bizarre. One thing led to another, and I started doing some research. And about, uh, I guess it was around the year 2000, and the telecom market in San Diego was, was really in descendancy. And the investors that we were working with kind of told us, you know, this would be a really kind of a good time to take a hiatus <laughs> before we have to fire you, you know, because the, you know, the money's drying up. A lot of us took the clue and kind of took a little hiatus as things got restructured. And while I had a little bit of downtime in between gigs, I decided, well, you know, this would be a good time to catch up on all the things I never got to read. And, you know, working startup companies, you work 16 hours a day, you, you know, so you don't have any time to look into this stuff. So I was really excited to have a little downtime to look into it. And so I started reading, and I was going to write a book on ancient technology, I figured. I was an engineer. I figured that would be right up my alley. And so I started with structural wow. stuff. I saw things like Baalbek, Lebanon, where they had thousand-ton stones at the third rung of the wall that nobody could move today. I'm thinking, hmm. So they had they had structural or engineering knowledge that we apparently didn't have. So that's where I started. So I bought a book on ancient transportation and technology and started researching that space. And the next thing I know, I, I, I stumbled upon Zechariah Sitchin's work. Yeah, and so uh, and I'd read some of Velikovsky's too, and I noticed you'd done a recent you'd done a recent interview with someone uh, about Velikovsky and the okay. and the Dogon. And uh, yeah, and so uh, so anyway, so I, I you know, and I had a little bit of um, knowledge about that as well. So the next thing I know, um, I've read all Sitchin stuff, and I'm in this crazy um, pursuit to help my kid. He was born with a genetic disorder called DeGeorge syndrome. And he's got loose structural tissue on his on his legs. Okay, and you're going now. How does this get to the Anunnaki? Okay. Well, little little did I know that uh, while I had just read all Sitchin stuff, and it kind of blew my mind in a way. And and I started corroborating, I guess, from that point. I started looking into some of the things he said to see what what we knew. And so I, you know, being an engineer, you know, the first thing you going to do is started jotting down all the darn names that showed up in his in his account. And uh, that led to. Uh, 
about a seven foot genealogy table that starts out prehistory on Nibiru and goes all the way forward, includes the Sumerian kings list and the, some of the genealogy work from Lawrence Gardner, which was fabulous. And I, and I combined and I combined those three together into a genealogy table to try to make sense of this whole name soup that was going on. But while that was happening, I was participating in structural work in Hawaii in order to learn a kind of an alternative healthcare method that could help my kid. And I and to make a long story short, I got exposed to somebody who knew a lot about history and had it was very very widely read and kind of turned no and then the idea of the Anunnaki came up because I was the first person I'd ever talked to about Sitchin's work and so and it wasn't a long conversation but it was enough trading back and forth of some of the tangible evidence I'd come across corroborating once I'd read his theory to, to look in further and, and it, it bolstered me to look a little bit farther because I really respected this guy and if he was you know if he was willing to look into this and even talk about it Maybe I wasn't so crazy by, you know, looking into a, th a theory about the origins of man that, that was so fantastic, but it was so scientific. You know, it really mm -hmm. appealed to the left side of my brain. So, so, so starting out, um, Zechariah Sitchin told, told us to go read some really important documents that, he, that inspired him on his search for human origins. And, and, through, and two of them he mentioned was the Enuma Elish and the Atrahasis. And so I took Drada's down, you know. And I was a Sitchinite totally by that time anyway, because I'd read I read all his stuff, even the the latest stuff that he's just published. And so, uh, and you know, and I, I found it fascinating. And I, and I took notes, and I and I studied this, and I compared it with his timelines, and I checked to see what evidence was in Africa, what you know, what had been discovered with our um, infrared satellites to determine what was what objects were in our solar system that nobody was telling us about, and blah blah blah. Okay, so I was in a corroboration mode for quite a while. And about, and so I started writing this book, um, The Anunnaki of Nibiru, I guess it was, I would say, 2004. So I'd been research, I'd been looking at this stuff since 2000. I started writing it in 2004. I was very excited. I figured I'd stumble on something that everybody needed to know, especially after decoding yeah. the Enuma Elish and the Atrahasis. Um, I, I s kind of came up with a what I call my God table that let me track their names across multiple cultures and I put this in my book so that people would have it and I started using that God table to make sense of the, some of the symbols I was seeing in, around the world in various countries and who was at odds with who and all of a sudden this this concept of the Enlilites and Enkiites started making a lot of sense to me where there looked like there was a Hatfield McCoy kind of feud going on and it had been going on a long time so that said it led me to the idea of this human origin story that such an had, had told and also existed on tablets that were in, on display in museums that we could clearly decode now. Uh, I was I was really confronted with my belief system, totally, and I was raised Southern Baptist, okay, and I was and I was a serious Southern Baptist, you know, no messing around. <laughs> and and I truly had read the Bible very thoroughly, and things in the Bible disturbed me. So I was I guess I was a bit open to reading other books outside of the Bible, even though those on the inside that have signed up to the dogma say I'm gonna be a member are highly encouraged not to read anything outside of the Bible, which I find ridiculous. I dug in really hard and started reading um, the Atrahasis, the New Umailish and the Epic Gil Gilgamesh because in those three accounts it introduced all the players and what happened to us and, and kind of set up the state of what we're in now. If you extrapolate forward one zodiacal house, you go, wow, okay, I get it now. So I'm going to jump back, give a little prehistory, and then lead up to uh, some of the other questions that we had as well. Is that okay? Okay. Please do, John. Please. This is fascinating. Okay. Okay. I'm so good. I'm going to I'm going to try to do sitch in a little justice here. And I have a pretty good memory, so I, 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 re <laughs> I remember a lot of the timelines and stuff. And if it turns into name soup for you, it's too much. In my book, and I've even put it online, uh, some of it online, and I'm going to publish my genealogy table, the digital version, very shortly. I just completed signing off on it today. We've been working on this for quite a while. Okay, so so I have published the, the photo, the, the picture of the genealogy table, and I gave it to people. It is a bit hard to read, though. Okay, so, so what's the story? What is the true history and origins of mankind, to my knowledge, given an engineering filter with the best, um, best uh, I don't know, I would call it, I wouldn't call it a belief system. I would call it a stopping point in the dialogue with the best information we have. 
that's what that's where I'm at. Okay, mm-hmm. you with me? So, okay, so mm-hmm. that said, okay. what do we know in the Sumerian records that we found? And there's been lots of them. I mean, lots of them, tens of thousands of them, and they're and they're they're able to be digitized. And there's a whole uh, uniform code text that you can download from your computer that has Sumerian uniform code on it. So, so you know, it's it's fully. It, it, there's no decipherment issues, to my knowledge. Okay. So that said, 450,000 years ago, according to the timeline, there were problems on another planet in our solar system called Nibiru. They were having atmospheric difficulties because every time they came close perihelion with the sun, being out in a 3,600-year retrograde orbit, they were having devastating effects happen to their atmosphere. And they were very sensitive to radiation. Apparently, their planet's geothermally heated. Being that far out past Pluto, they don't receive a lot of direct solar heating, and so they manage their greenhouse uh, accordingly. So the atmosphere is designed to keep heat in and radiation out. According to the Sumerian prehistory documents, and I have these on the genealogy table, at the time that uh, these perturbations were happening about 450,000 years ago, their king was named Alalu, and he was an unjust ruler who would usurp the throne from another ruler named Lamu. Now, by the way, some of these names, if you pay attention to them, they also show up in the genealogy table, and they're affiliated with planets. So you had, you had been talking with your uh, guest who was doing the Dogon, and he was talking about Velikovsky's association of myths with the planetary astrology. Well, listen, it's serious. <laughs> and I have a whole table to, yeah. to summarize who did what to who, okay? Yeah. And this all comes from the Enuma Elish, by the way, if you read that. This is the Babylonian epic of creation that describes how our solar system came to be. So the idea of Venus uh, being a, an oddity, uh, while I'm on that topic, consider the fact if you take the orbit of Earth around the sun, well, let's call it 365, and I know there's questions about that. <laughs> And um, Venus is 225. You divide that, you get 1.618. Does that number ring a bell? Yeah, wow. that's a trip, huh? That's the number, the design number phi that shows up everywhere. So, <laughs> so that comes from the Fibonacci sequence of doing the. I never. Yeah, that where you divi- you know where you divide uh, um, the previous the, the Fibonacci number by its previous, and after a very short order, it collapses to 1.618. This is the, the design number of, of quote unquote God to a lot of people. Yeah, and the Italians use it for the design of beauty. Right, right. Well, this this number went into building all kinds of architectures. It's in your body. It's everywhere. So I thought I found that very interesting that Earth and Venus were uniquely related that way. None of the other ones are the way I checked. <laughs> Being an engineer, so where were we? So four hundred fifty thousand years ago, disturbances on the planet, atmospheric problems. Alalu's in charge. He basically has an encounter with his rightful cupbearer who was supposed to be in charge and his name was Anu and he's in the, my genealogy table as well his wife's name was Antu Anu finally had enough of this unjust ruler they had a wrestling match that's how they solved things there naked very interesting they wrestled he won Alalu then was going to be after he lost the rulership he was going to be tried for his usurpation where he pushed somebody out the window and about that time he got a space vessel left Nibiru, escaped, and he was going to be exiled anyway. He escaped into exile and landed on the Earth. Well, apparently they'd been doing spectroscopic studies of all the planets in retrograde orbit. They had a mobile observatory and had discovered gold on the Earth. And gold being such a great radiation shield, we use it in space on rad hard parts and all kinds of things now. Clearly they knew about it. And he reported back to Nibiru that there was gold here and he wanted back in. He wanted back He didn't want to be in exile. So he was using this as a leverage to help mitigate their environmental problems and get his political way. <laughs> well, Anu then uh, decided, okay. So he sent his firstborn son, who was a scientist, their premier scientist. His planet affiliation was Neptune. He was called E.A. Nudimud in the, in the um, Enuma Elish account. But his, his actual name to us uh, on Earth was Enki. So Enki, about 5,000 years later, about 445,000 years ago, came to Earth. He landed in the Persian Gulf in a vessel in his fish suit, walked ashore, uh, decided that uh, he was going to connect with Alalu and then determine whether this report of gold was true. They did find gold in the Persian Gulf, and it was both in monoatomic form and in uh, colloidal solution in the ocean, and that's how they were going to mine it initially. So they built the city of Eridu, right where the, uh, the Tigris and Euphrates meet and emptied into the Persian Gulf. So the very first 
city on this planet that we know of, at least from that civilization, was about 445,000 years ago. And it, was, and it still exists today, and you can see it uh, from Google Earth. The bricks are sticking out of the sand. It does not look like it's been excavated, and I cannot understand why. That said, <laughs> um, they weren't getting gold fast enough, and apparently Lalu then had another encounter with Anu there on the planet, and he ended up in his final exile because he did not get back in on Mars where they built a pyramid edifying his face there where he died. So the, the, so the pyramid on Mars is a Lalu's face. Very, very interesting. And there was some, one of his, uh, I think it was Anzu, well, one of the Anzu clan also went there with him and died. So Enki proceeded to try to get gold. Apparently he wasn't getting it fast enough in the Persian Gulf. He then vect was vectored to Africa, the southeast corner of Africa, down along the Zambezi River. And apparently they were uh, successful there, started mining gold. He had brought about 50 workers with him initially. They were called the Igigi, I-G-I-G-I, that shows up in the Atrahasis account. And after many shars, according to the Atrahasis, well, shars, 3,600 years. And you can verify that in the Sumerian kings list, though, because they list their rulerships in shars. So eight shars, for instance, is 28,800 years if you look at the first Sumerian king. Wow. So they had been working many shars on the earth. Remember, we're back 445,000 years ago. Now move forward probably a couple hundred thousand years they've been working in these mines, okay? They finally had had enough, and by that time, it looks like they had about 600. Uh, they revolted, um, and in the Atrahasis account, Allah gave his fellow gods a speech, riled them up, told them to burn their tools, and they headed to his dad's house, Enlil's house, who had a fortress there in South Africa, and demanded relief. Okay, this is all... all documented on Sumerian tablets, by the way. This is not me making stuff up. About this time, the Anunnaki called a council meeting. Mm -hmm. Anu was summoned. Enki was summoned. Ninurta was summoned. And several of them were there. And basically, we got to find out what a brutal taskmaster this Enlil character was. Now, who is Enlil? Enlil was sent 5,000 years later than Enki to the Earth to kind of be the commander, if you will. Enki was a scientist. He probably wasn't that great at bureaucratic <laughs> you know machinations but his brother was was uh, actually in line to rule he was a higher ranking than Enki his rank was 50 and Enki's rank was 40 so Enlil comes down was given the Mesopotamian region and Enki's down in Africa mining gold okay with these Ajiji who you know who weren't producing it fast enough eating for that for Enlil so Enlil ended up with a fortress down there to drive it a little faster so here they are surrounding his house uh, they burned all their tools, and Allah, of all names, think about that, turns out is Nanar Sin, who is Enlil's son, his oldest son. So the moon god, Allah, is Enlil's son. And he was oh. also on the Sumerian council in 3760 BC, he held rank there. So now they're surrounding the house. Uh, they have a council meeting, say, what are we going to do? Enlil says, hey, let's just kill one and make him go back to work. So you can kind of get an idea what this guy's like. He's a, he, by the way, he's clearly not a, a friend of mankind. Okay, I just want to put that out there. And, and the, the whole account is written by autobiographically by Atrahasis, who turns out to be um, related to Enki. And I'm going to save that one for a second. So, okay, so they're surrounding the house. They want relief. And the council calls a, a few other members together, including Nin Hartzog, who was Enki's half-sister. So we've got Enlil, Enki, and Nin Hartzog, they're all the children of Anu, who is there, okay? But Anlil and Enki are half-brothers, and Nin Hartzog is their half-sister, and she's the medical officer known as Isis in Egypt. Very important person, okay? So about, about this time, uh, Anu and Enki go, well, I don't know. I think you've worked them a little hard. I, I think they do deserve relief. And they ban bantied about whether to produce tools or how they were going to replace these these. They call them gods. I mean, these Ajiji were not, you know, mutant <laughs> subservience. They were apparently very capable. They just so happened to be the ones uh, doing the work. So they got together and decided that they were going to produce a primitive worker to replace the Ajiji miners. And the faster, the better. They appointed who else but the scientists and the medical officer to go and do that. And that was Enki and his half-sister in Hartzog. So in the accounts, in the Sumerian documents, he had a house of Shimti in South Africa, his lab, his genetics lab, where they messed around with uh, the bipedal hominids. Remember I talked about Lucy, who was three and a half million years old on, in the, where Lewis and Leakey found her, but there were other 
hominids that had survived that were much, you know, like the Neanderthal, and, and they, they apparently go back about a million years forward. And, and in between there, there was uh, even some talk about whether it was Cro-Magnum or Neanderthal, but uh, it was about about uh, 220,000 years ago, according to the genetic record. And this is from the Genetic Eve and Genetic Adam study that was tracked to determine our origins. And they both point about 200,000 years ago in South Africa, the same area where these gold mines were found. Okay. So let's talk about that just a little bit. So in South Africa, Michael Tellinger went down there based on the same Sumerian story and was looking for the gold mines that these Anunnaki were mining. In particular, en Enki and, and, and Enlil was there too, okay? But it was primarily Enki's gig. And, of course, he found a lot of stone structures. Uh, a lot of the gold mines were found as well. So the Anglo-American Mining Corporation turns out and, and owns a lot of these, and it, and it actually even carbon dated some of them. You know, so you have to ask yourself, first of all, and they carbon dated them to about 100,000 years old. Who was mining gold in South Africa 100,000 years ago? And the Sumerians tell us who it was. So I went forward that. I'm like, okay. So, you know, just another corroborating piece of information, right? So our first yeah. genetic yeah. studies show that they came out of there, and now all of a sudden the gold mines are in the same place. So, um, so put, putting two and two together, um, it, it made a lot of sense. So through the, the Atrahasis account, they talk about all the iterations they went through to produce these chimeras, these genetic primitive workers to replace the uh, Gigi. And they were finally successful. And uh, and later on in another account, they actually took that Adapa to Mi Anu back on Nibiru so they could introduce him to this, this primitive mm -hmm. worker that was created. So, And it's a very detailed account. In that account, it was really important what came out of it and that Anu ordered one of the, one of the escorts to be mankind's teacher. And that turns out to be none other than Enki's son, Ningshida, who was also there because he was a scientist as well. And he was the one responsible for the genetic upgrade so the first primitive workers could procreate. Ningshida escorted uh, both of them up to the Garden of Eden, which was in the city of Eridu. And he was the caduceus bearer. He was very scientific. He was Enki's premier um, son. And he was known as Thoth in Egypt. So I, I just wanted to introduce his role there before we move forward with this story about Atrahasis. Mm -hmm. So at that point, let's go up to the Garden of Eden, Eden in Samaria, which is the city that Enki built when he first landed there 445,000 years ago. So it's right at the southern end of uh, where the Tigris and Euphrates dump into the Persian Gulf, just as a reminder. And I found some pictures online of the city. It was very interesting. It was taken in 1973 by the University of Chicago, and they, they showed a couple of the archaeologists walking around with a few of the bricks sticking out of the ground. There was a Google Earth uh, overhead view that you can see of Eridu as well, so I encourage people to get on Google Earth and go check it out. It, it, and it mm -hmm. looks completely undisturbed, like why have they not excavated this most important site on the planet? Probably have to some degree. We just don't know about it. Sure. So, so at the Garden of Eden, Enki and Enlil were there primarily. So this is your your Genesis account of the Garden of Eden. Now you realize the Sumerian account is much older, and and who was really there? So they were there to observe this genetic upgrade that Ningxi had performed, so that these uh, primitive workers that were the chimeric combination of the Anunnaki, Enki himself, along with Ovum from a uh, a female bipedal hominid that they found roaming on the steppes of Africa. So that's really who we are, a mixture of Anunnaki and uh, Neand uh, Neanderthal genes. So um, at this point, they're watching them in the garden to see if they can procreate. And this is where all the crazy dogma of the church gets imposed on mankind, you know, our fallen state and so on and so forth. Well, um, the reality was um, Enlil was not in his, I mean, he w it was his ter territory by that point. But the city of Eridu was still Enki's. So, and it, he had a temple there and everything else. So, so the fact that they were out in his medicinal garden looking at these primitive workers that were naked and determining uh, you know, whether they are going to produce enough offspring to meet the labor requirement, Enel tells them don't eat any so specific plant in Enki's garden because you know, he was a scientist. He's out gathering all, all different kinds of plants from all over the planet, probably the Amazon rains for us. He probably knew all about... Uh, MAO inhibitors and DMT too. So you know, <laughs> so so anyway, um, Enlil tells him, "Don't eat it, or you'll die." In the in the Genesis count, right? And then uh, 
course, the evil snake that shows up, the caduceus bearer, twin serpents going up a pole, was representative of a snake to, to Enlil, but reality was it was a symbol for a geneticist. So, so this evil snake was there. It turned out to be Enki. And Enki says, oh, no, actually, you won't die. You'll just acquire the consciousness that we have. And he was telling them the truth, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and you read the account. Guess what? They didn't die. They, they, became, they had a consciousness-changing experience. And Enlil got pissed and threw them out of the garden. That's the real story of what happened. So, but they were successful at procreating. So that was, that was the real test, and that's what they were there for. So while they were being watched like lab animals <laughs> to see if they could uh, do their thing, they finally realized they could. Um, actually, the Adapa, or Adam, was um, super, he was intercepted by Enki, taken off to his temple and taught everything that he knew while Enlil had thrown him out, you know, put him in exile. You know, they went on to have offspring, and Enki uh, had an offspring with Eve, and you can see that in my genealogy table, I'll show you. That one was, was Cain, and the other one was Abel. So, so you realize that the genealogy of the story about Cain and Abel, why that was so important. And even in that account, in the Sumerian account, it introduces Marduk and Ninurta, the offspring of uh, Enki, and uh, an offspring of Enlil training Cain and Abel. So there was another... Uh, sources of conflict behind that whole story, which when you read the Sumerian accounts, are very illuminating. Okay, so we've, so we've left the Garden of Eden now. Let's fast forward 600 years of the successful breeding program that's been implemented by the Anunnaki. And if you go back to Genesis as well, when the flood came, it was 600 years after Noah was the king of the city of Sherupak. Well, Sherupak is a city there. It was pre-diluvial in southern Iraq. And it turned out it was the medical center for Ninhartsog. Okay, so he's the king of the city, and she's the medical officer that's taken up residence there. So, so mm. keep that in mind as you now reread that. Well, at this point, apparently Enlil had been watching some of his primitive workers that he'd absconded with from South Africa and brought them up to Mesopotamia to serve him. And, you know, he was still letting them run around naked like animals, drinking out of puddles, uh, you know, like animals. And, mm. and apparently something that they were doing was really uh, pissing him off. And he called a council meeting, and this is in the Altrahasis account. After 600 years, he said the people had grew, grown too broad, as, and they were bellowing like a bull, and he wanted them silenced. So he d decided somehow this council agreed to his wishes. He was the top of the council anyway, holding the Lord of the Earth command at rank 50. Well, in the Altrahasis account, he asked that a disease be introduced to the populace for culling them. Now imagine that. Imagine that as a governing methodology here in the United States or there in Ireland, you know. Uh, well, yeah, you know, we got too many people and they're making too much noise, so just introduce this disease over genocide. here. Genocide. It's total genocide. Premeditated genocide. Mm. Okay, so it started, and I'll, I'll just fast forward and not get too negative on this because we've got a lot of ground to cover. So he introduced a couple of diseases, a Saku disease, a Rupert disease. That didn't do enough damage, and you can read in the Altrahasis with the effects of these diseases. It was nasty. I, I remind you of the Black Plague, Black Death in Europe in the Middle Ages. Sure. Uh -huh, sure. Uh -huh. So uh, then that wasn't enough. Cut off the food, cut off the water, anything he could to start get rid of these primitive workers that his genetic half-brother who was conducting a genetic war against him and occupying and controlling the earth. That's how he probably viewed it as a commander, right? He had no problem wiping them out whatsoever. Now, were they, were they evil all the time like the like the canonical Bible says? I don't know, maybe, but they were also down in the mines working their ass off day and night for Enlil, so maybe they weren't evil while they were doing that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So let's go forward. And the final act that uh, Enlil asked his half-brother to do to get rid of the humans was to bring a flood and destroy the rest of them. And, and, and each iteration of these uh, attacks by Enlil on the populace, these genocidal... Uh, incursions, Enki pushed back and he used uh, and counseled Atrahasis on what to do about it. He actually, at one point, he reminded me of Gandhi and how he told, uh, when they cut off the food supply, he told them to bake bread and go give it to uh, I, one of uh, Enlil's kids. I can't remember which one. It wasn't Isker. I think it was Nintaba. Yeah, it was Nintaba. And he was the one that controlled the grains, apparently. Well, so they supposedly they were given the task to go shame him into stopping what he was doing by baking him a nice lo couple of loaves of bread. And apparently, uh, apparently, you know, these these tactics that Enki came up with uh, worked for a while. Finally, Enlil, Enlil had, had enough. Well, absolutely ordered his brother. He was a higher-ranking guy. He was like, do it. Bring a flood and wipe him out. And 
the whole council was sworn to secrecy not to tell anyone that it was going to happen now whether it was and there's controversy over this whether it was the passing of Nibiru that caused the the flood. Um, caused the flood by breaking off a polar ice cap and causing a huge tsunami, which was reported by them, by the way. Whether it was that or whether Enki actually had something to do with it. I think actually knowing Enki is a benefactor, I don't think he would have done that. But if some event was coming and he was sworn not to tell anyone about it, that that's a, possi that's that's a possibility, especially if it was a natural event. Mm. So, so apparently he swore his oath. He uh, then decided to go to this, the king of Shurupak's house and talk to the wall and disclose the story without actually talking to Atrahasis himself. So Atrahasis is the name of the account. It turns out another name, he had other names, okay? Uh, and they're, of course we know him as Noah, right? But they knew him as Ziasudra and Atrahasis and in the Epic of Gilgamesh they called him Utnapishtim, okay? So Gilgamesh referred to him as Utnapishtim, he of the far away, or, or he, who had found how, he who had found life, I think is what he referred to. So anyway, Enki discloses to Atrahasis at the reed hut that this flood's coming to get his boat. And you know, he's the king of Shurupak. <laughs> so now he's got to tell the elders some story that they're going to believe so he can, he can get out. So Enki told him that uh, he was having problems with his half-brother Enlil, and that since it was now Enlil's territory, that he had to leave. So, uh, so Atrahasis built the boat, boat as Enki told him to, and uh, packed it up. Apparently, it was a, it was more of a, a genetic seed bank on uh, a float than it was uh, bringing two animals every kind. They probably brought their domesticated animals that they had local on their farm, but uh, Enki and it, Norway, uh, Gerald, haven't we? We've got a seed bank in Norway. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's yeah there's a couple of them around the world. Some of the some of the wealthy of the world have uh, seen to that, especially in the cold places where, the, <laughs> where they don't need refrigeration. So um, Enki directs a, a navigator that's related to him also on the boat, take Atrahasis and his family to Mount Ararat. And uh, about that time, the Anunnaki bust out of the cities and their, and their, and their winged disc to avoid the calamity. While they were in the air uh, surveying flood damage, Nin Hartzog, who was the mother of us all, right? This is Enki's half sister that bore the first baby for him, in, in, kind of through this in vitro fertilization, and many other after that. She was aghast at the carnage that this flood had brought, looking at the humans down in the clay like they were little sticks of, you know, washed up in piles. It's just unbelievable how uh, she, she had been talked into this covenant with Enlil to keep quiet about what's coming. And uh, it goes on and on. And it's very dramatic. But about that time, Enlil looks and sees a, a vessel on Mount Ararat and gets highly irate, wanting to know who broke their oath to the humans such that anything survived. And, he, and actually, uh, he uses a self-referential term for the Anunnaki at this point, which I hadn't seen other places where he calls himself, he calls himself the Anuna. So it's kind of short for Anunnaki, the Anuna. Wow, like a nickname. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so they take, they, they take their wing disc and he and Nin Hartzog and Enki and I, I, there was one other in there, I can't remember, and Enlil was there. They landed on the hill, um, found uh, Atrahasis there. He had built an altar to, uh, I don't know, kind of give uh, credence to his father, Enki, <laughs> turns out. So this, this gets exposed here on the hill. So Enki gets lambasted by Enlil for somehow breaking his oath. Enki kind of confesses and he goes, I did it in defiance of you. So that life would be sustained, because uh, we can't survive here without without their help. <laughs> they they do all our food, they do all our labor. I mean, they, imagine having to do all that yourself. Mm. So uh, so then at that point, he finally admits to Enlil that Atrahasis is his son, and that's why he saved him. So the idea that Noah was Enki's son is so important. Now now think about the whole silly Noah movie that just came out, and how just what a red herring that whole thing is. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Sure. So. So anyway, everybody likes to hear the, the Noah flood story. But actually, that brings us up to the point in the Fertile Crescent in Turkey and Syria and Iraq. The, the whole area in there was the, termed the Fertile Crescent around the south end of the Black Sea because it was where agriculture really took off. And the reason it was uh, important to mankind, is they've done genetic studies to look at this, and this comes up in the book, the book Guns, Germs, and Steel where Jared Diamond describes, uh, you know, how we've identified that our 
domesticated cattle and grains came from that area about 12,000 years ago. Well, this is coincident with the last last ice age when apparently this polar ice cap broke off and caused the flood. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, 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 gee, from the chronology standpoint, looking at history, this it all, all it all it all makes sense. So now you come forward from the, that Fertile Crescent area, knowing that domestic sheep showed up there and cattle. Yeah. Um, and read the Sumerian accounts. They actually described after taking the um, the Adapa to Nuburu to meet Anu, two two very important people accompanied him. And then they and then there's a story afterwards. So Dumuzi and Ningshida both went. Dumuzi was an offspring of Enlil, and I thought it was Enki until I looked at my genealogy table the other day. Whoops. And um, and Ningshida was Enki's son. So they were both summoned to take the Adapa to meet Anu. Well, Dumuzi got kept back on Nuburu. I think they kept him back to study the effects of gravity on his body over a long exposure on the planet. But Ningshida was sent forward, and in one Shar's time, they said they were going to send Dumuzi back with the with the essence of yews. And basically, he was going to bring the genetics back from these creatures so they could spawn them on the earth, including several seed grains and crops. So everybody's very excited when Dumuzi showed back up after being retained on Nabooru for a shower, uh, with with this, uh, you know, with these um, with seeds and, and genetic material, which landed in the Fertile Crescent area and then got propagated through everyone else. So I think that's that's a really neat genetic study. Okay, so I, I, I once again gave credence to Jared Diamond's book Guns, Turns, and Steel. The reason being is I was traveling to Turkey, reading that book, and you know absorbing this material and realizing that that happened in the very area where I was visiting. Wow. Yeah, so... You were in Kalyak in Turkey on business, weren't you? Yeah, well, well, I actually landed in Istanbul, and then I got onto a vessel at the Sea of Marmara where they cross over, and from the, you know, the Black Sea crosses over mm -hmm. to the, the Strait of Bosphorus, and then there's a bridge there connecting Europe and Asia, and then on, on the other side of that is, is the Black Sea. So the Black Sea to the north, the Sea of Marmara, is where it spilled over the Strait of Bosphorus to the south near Istanbul. And you go just farther down into the Sea of Marmara there, on one of those shores is where uh, uh, Schliemann found the city of Troy. So it was right, it was right, it, right in that, right in that absolute that area. You've got it. So it's really amazing. Anyway, how did I get on Turkey? Oh, so we're so now we kind of have an idea of the flood and and forward. So. At this point, um, you can start asking some pretty hard questions like, well, did they leave or did they stay? And, and a lot of people want to know that because they want to know if they're influencing governments and their lives here on Earth, right? Well, so, so what we know, go ahead. Sure, yeah. I mean, like from these guys are warring factions. This is our history. I pretty much accept this, Gerald. I mean, I see the Sumerian count from many authors, and, and, and I love your stuff. Gerald, because you have a wide spectrum to look at this from an engineering science perspective. But, uh, you know, the, the, are these guys still here? That's the bit. If they were there in the past, well, why aren't they still here today? Are, are they here? Are they, you know, is, is this battle for the resources of Earth still going on, Gerald? Well, that's a very good question. So um, let me give you a, kind of a little background information. While they were here doing their mining operation and their controlling their bond heaven earth so they could stay in touch with Nibiru. That was, that fell under, um, it actually fell under Nin Hartzog's authority. She got given the Sinai Peninsula as her region, even though the end will look like he assumed it was his and treated it as such. Morning factions, this Sumerian history we're talking about, you know, these guys are battling over Earth's resources in ancient times. Are they still here? You know, oh, okay. Are, right, who's right. Who's good, who's bad, who's <laughs> going to win? <laughs> Right. Okay. So I, I wanted to start with a little tidbit that I brought before I, and I lost track of that question because that there was a point in time where an emissary was sent from Nibiru to the higher ranking uh, Anunnaki council members to give them a message. And this was circa, I believe it was circa 500 BCE time frame. Okay. And about that time, and his name was Galzu, and he was a classmate with Nin Hartzog back on Nibiru. And he also was the one that indicated to her that uh, she was experiencing more advanced aging than he was because they were, they were peers in classroom, and she had aged much more than he had. And he pointed that out on a visit. Well, on his next message to them, um, it was very urgent that they get this message from Anna to them. And the message was, for, and he only specified a certain number of people, and it looked like it was the 
early um, lead party from the Anunnaki that came to the Earth and had been here too long. Apparently, gravity had affected their bodies in a way that they had not perceived. And because of the adaptation their bodies had made to the gravity field, if they went back to Nibiru, they'd have, they couldn't operate normally, and it was, to, it was purported that they would die. So really bad news. Enlil did not take it well. So what am I telling you is that by about 500 BCE, a whole bunch of them left. They were given the choice to stay on the Earth and not be enslaved to the gravity field, or they could go back to Nibiru. Okay. So, uh, so, so who was here that was on the advance team? Enki and Enlil and Ninhart Sog and Nanar Sin and Enlil's son Ala, who shows up in the Ultra Hases count. Ninurta, Ningshida, and a couple others. And all their offspring that were the offspring of the Greek demigods, right, and the Egyptian demigods, those were all their offspring, and a lot of them ended up staying too. So now that we know that they had to stay because of their enslavement to the gravity field. It's a tough call, <clears throat> isn't it, Gerald? I mean, yeah, you, uh, imagine. Yeah, you're on Earth, Earth as an outpost, and you're like, well, you might have to stay forever now. Well, <laughs> Come it, back. Well, that, that actually, you know, um, it was interesting because the ones that had noble character said, well, you know, we started this mission and we're going to see it through and these are our creation and we're, and we're here with them. And that was uh, Enki and Ninhartzog and Ningshita types. Of course, he was ordered by Anu to be mankind's teacher. Don't forget that. Very, very important, his role. And that was uh, Mercury, Thoth, um, Hermes, okay, the same being, the one who wrote the Emerald Tablets. So from an exo exopolitical standpoint, assuming these warring factions uh, are still here, which they are, have, you, have, have the war stopped in the last zodiacal age? Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. Still going on. <laughs> They're still, still going on. And, and it's pretty clear right now what they valued. Uh, they valued uh, fuel for their vessels, uh, materials for their beautiful temples, and apparently gold for couple of purposes yeah to mon put it into a powder form and spread it like talcum powder in their atmosphere to shield radiation uh, that seemed to be a losing battle though i mean imagine every every time it goes around the sun you got to redo this <laughs> so that was like a quick fix this monatomic gold was like a quick fix system girl for the, yeah i don't for the... well they 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 were actually debating um respawning um, volcanoes on their planet having all the sulfur gases and stuff and to um, spew up and recreate an artificial layer for them using nuclear weapons in their account. This was about 450,000 years ago. That's what spawned them to leave to come to the Earth in the first place or to get something that they got ionized in their atmosphere that would act as a proper shield. Now, are there other places in the solar system to get gold? Probably. But for some reason, the Earth had an, an, at least enough that was over their threshold that we decided it was worthwhile to come here and get it. And you, and you can clearly see uh, from the gold mines in South Africa establishing gold as the currency for, for uh, our world economy and all the other reasons. Uh, and all those shenanigans that went on with earlier religions and conquests over getting gold. It was, you know, so there was a reason for that. And there, was a, there were forces behind the governments and the queens and the explorers to go and do that. And it was the Anunnaki. Mm. So, so let's talk about this aging problem. Apparently, one of the some of the solutions they came up with were her, hormonal. For instance, there are hormones that come from horse urine, and there are hormones that come from various places that we use today. Well, apparently, from a femi from the female Anunnaki Babylonian birth goddess, this is what they called them. From their gen from their menstrual flow, certain hormones were created that actually activated the pineal gland. And uh, so these ancient uh, rituals of Heros Gatnos and some of the others involved uh, that knowledge where they were using the chalice and the, fl and the flower, you know, the, the flower, you know. <laughs> Think about that monthly flowing. But as they progressed, it seemed like their knowledge advanced in metallurgy, and they figured out how to achieve the same thing with uh, a monoatomic element. And this is a really interesting story out of Hathor's Temple, which is on Mount Sinai, and we've, disco right. and we've discovered it, and it's been explored. This is where Lawrence Gardner disclosed the fact that they had found lots of monoatomic gold underneath a stone in the floor. Awesome reason, Lawrence. No. Yeah, he was really terrific, really great uh, genealogist, too. So, anyway, so this is where we discovered the idea of the Anunnaki ingesting monoatomic bread cakes <laughs> made out of this strange powder, and why were they doing that? Well, we, we now know they were using it to turn their, their energy body into a superconductor, uh, and we know that's what monoatomics do now. Um, they were using it to enhance their consciousness, and most importantly of all, 
including activating DMT in their in their in their uh, pineal gland. The most important thing of all to them was uh, Nin Hartzog, being the medical officer, needed a solution for this rapid aging on this planet that was going around the, the sun too fast relative to their old perspective. Of one, one year for them is 3,600 years to us. So it's a big deal. Mm. <clears throat> so, that, so in general, the concept of aging at different rates based on the proximity you are away from your sun, that's, that's an interesting thing to think about because it probably has to do with your exposure to radiation. If you think about Gerald, it, you think if these guys are living so long on the bureau, that's why they're so clever. I mean, you well, think about Arthur yeah, yeah. Arthur. Well, yeah. I purportedly their IQ is around twelve hundred, and depending on how pure their race, their breed is, they don't live forever. But apparently, the ones who are not doing something to keep their telomeres from decaying live about eight hundred years, and after about six hundred years, according to some of the writings, they start becoming what's called a gaborum. They start becoming a giant. And apparently on our gravity field here, whenever that happens for them, they get a disparity between their internal organ growth and their skeletal growth, and that's what actually ends up killing them after about 800 years. Wow. That's what's been told to me. So it seems to make sense, because if you go back to the, the story about Nimrod in the Bible, who many people believe was Gilgamesh, he became, began becoming a Gaborim, which was a giant, after a certain period of time. And I think that's partly what also sent him off on his little quest to find Utnapishtim, who was Atrahasis, who was Noah. So Can he I could take a slight track there, Gerald. Do you think that the American military went into Iraq to get Gilgamesh's body? Did you read about that? Yeah, in 1991, I thought that was really interesting. Um, Saddam Hussein was, was dealing with the United States military, about to go route him out of Kuwait. But at the same time, he was running a huge engineering project to empty where the Tigris and Euphrates were emptying down into the reeded area that used to dump into the Persian Gulf, and he was trying to get all that water out there around the city of Uruk, because that was where Gilgamesh was king, circa 2900 BC. Yeah, <laughs> Huge engineering project. He's doing. So while he's doing that, once he got it dry, he brought in a team of Germans with a magnetometer so he could find, a, you know, map out the city, and it turned out to be over five kilometers in size. Wow. So they found the walls that Gilgamesh described and all the stuff he described in his in his epic, including where he said his grave was going to be. So that was reported by the BBC in a press release in 2003 that they had found Gilgamesh's grave. And that's about the last we heard of it. Well, if they found his grave, knowing his mother was Nin's son, his father was Lugal Banda, and he was on the Sumerian king's list, very important. Genetic material. Yeah. Genetic material. Tell me about, you know, because he would have been two-thirds pure Anunnaki. Now, if they'd have found his mother's grave, if she was around, uh, Nin's son, she was full-blown Anunnaki. So that's all we need is, is one who's partial, one that's full-blown, and then the enslavement sample of a chimera of us and the Neanderthal. And you got the whole story absolutely proven, and that's been kept from us, and you know it has. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, so, so going forward from all this mess in the Atrahasis, the Numa Elish, and the Epic of Gilgamesh, we get this name list that ends up as the Anunnaki Council, many of them. And let's start extrapolating that forward. If we're to assume we know what their symbols are, and we're to assume that they, un, against their will, had to stay here. Otherwise, you know, they would have died. Now, would they have been able to progressively, maybe like coming from a deep sea diver, decompress as they went to experience gravity in between Nibiru's orbit and, and the Earth? Possibly. Maybe they could go to close planets like Venus and Mars without you know, suffering too much. I don't know. I think it would be more of a geometry issue relative to gravity than it would distance, mm -hmm. from the, distance from the sun. But anyway, that's just my understanding. So I think it has a lot to do with the radiation exposure. So assuming they're still here, I just told you that I believe Enlil, Nanar Sin, who was Allah, and Enki and Ningshita are still here. Now, if that's the case... If that's the case, the, the gods from Greece, you know, they, they translated directly. The Greek pantheon of 12 was the Anunnaki Council of 12. Straight, straight transfer. So Zeus, the head of the council, was Enlil. Poseidon, his arch-rival brother, half-brother, was Enki. And that story did not change from Samaria to Greece. Mm -hmm. And all the rest of them, too. Ninkshita uh, in uh, Samaria became Thoth in Egypt. Of course, that was his dad's domain, so he had reason to be down in Egypt. And then he became Quetzalcoatl in Latin America, and then he became Hermes, or actually, right before he became Quetzalcoatl, he was, uh, he was Hermes to the Greek. And then he came, became Mercury to the Romans. Okay, so he's, he, gets, he gets around. <laughs> so, assuming they're still here, 
that they had major battles. Read the uh, War of Gods and Men from Sitchin to see the extent of how much these guys brutalize each other. And plus, the Mahabharata and several ancient documents describe these winged gods firing missiles at each other, and some of them have the power to burn the flesh off an elephant while it was still standing. So you know they were nuking each other. Yeah, nukes. Yeah. yeah. These guys were a pretty uh, noisy bunch, Gerald. They were vicious to each other. Yeah, yeah, they were. They were. They absolutely were. And uh, if you, it's interesting. I I find it interesting. But before Islam overtook Iran as the as the state's religion, you realize they were they were of the Zoroastrian religion. Yeah. Zoroastrian. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this was this was uh, B.C. about uh, 1000 B.C.E. Zor the Zoroastrian religion was still in play. And I think it, it was around 535, I got to go look at my notes, when, when, the, when the Muslim army came in and finally overtook. Uh, and, and then, you know, of course, Islam became the religion in Iran. Well, before that, um, the region had summarized these Anunnaki gods on the Council of Twelve into the two most powerful ones. And it was, it was, a, it was Ahura Mazda who shows up on the Persepolis Temple, the Cliffs of Behistun, and many other places where Enki's in his wing disc flying around. <laughs> it's pretty obvious. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and you see that in Samaria too, the same symbol. Well, the, his arch rival, and he was known as the, the good, the, the wise creator, you know, the God of light and wisdom. Whereas his arch rival, they had believed that it was the great destroyer, the great deceiver. And he was called Araman or Angra Mainyu, and that was Enlil. <laughs> and that was an accurate description of the two most powerful beings that were on the Anunnaki Council relative to uh, mankind's fate and destiny they, and they were not kidding it was a pre it was the predecessor religion for christianity islam and several others so uh, it all started with enel and enki right so that's really important to know so so now we know that enki represents light and enel represents dark and they may switch roles every other zodiacal house or so we don't know for sure but this is the role that they're, what they're, that they're playing. It, at least it's been consistent from the Atrahasis all the way forward through the Bible. <laughs> Look at the Old Testament where Genesis 126, where uh, they said, let us in our image create mankind. Well, that was the council decision of the Anunnaki in Africa while the Ajiji miners were surrounding Enlil's house and they made that decision. So now, <laughs> so now all of a sudden you connect those two and go, oh, well, now that makes sense. So... Which the is that gets me, yeah, sorry, John. The bit that get me is that the Anunnaki Council of Twelve let this Enki Enlil battle go on; that they were tolerant of it or accepting of it. Well, the only person that was higher ranking than them were there was was uh, well, Enlil's wife would have been outranked Enki, and then Anu and his wife; those were the only ones above them. So, and Anu and his wife were back on Nibiru. So, when they're out on this uh, foray on a on a on a, a planet and another planet on the solar system, uh, their their laws apparently were open to interpretation according to free reign. <laughs> they had a free range. They to... they acted they acted like it was the wild west and they were unconstrained. They and whatever forces they could bring to bear, they did. So in the way battlefields today, when when uh, is every military that goes into battle perfectly uh, complying to all rules of combat? No, there's there's military that break the rules, like so. Well, not... well, absolutely. So, and actually, if you read about the uh, GG in the Lost Book of Enoch, when some of them were named for violating Enlil's orders to keep the keep the primitive workers stupid and and <laughs> and dumbed down so they could uh, be good slaves, well, they were teaching them metallurgy and a whole bunch of other. Uh, I know occult knowledge, hidden knowledge that they weren't supposed to know, and it just infuriated Enlil. So you know his his M.O. all along was uh, elevation of consciousness. What? <laughs> Keep those slaves at work all the time, and that's all they need to know. Period <laughs> is what I tell them. So you know he was he was a brutal taskmaster, and you you could tell by the way he ruled them. So uh, now keep that in mind as he became Jehovah and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as he left the city of Ur and, and, and Nippur, which was mission control headquarters, in the, in the, and moved up to the Levantine when the water got too high and started destroying the pre-diluvial Anunnaki cities. So that's how he ended up at mission control in Jerusalem. Okay, So uh, carry forward the attributes of Enlil and the genocidal things he did to the one that's uh, running... I don't know, all three world's religions. If you're venerating Abram, who was, who was Enlil's general, then he's got you. Because he, he started all three of them. So keep that in mind. So now we've talked about who's light, who's dark, which is which, and who wins. Well, if you were to assess the last zodiacal house age, 
in the culling effect of man's inhumanity to man, I would let you guess who's winning. Is it light or dark? At the moment, it seems to be dark, but I, I have faith that light will win, Gerald. <laughs> well, you and I both do, or we probably wouldn't be doing this. Cause it, wouldn't be talking here, otherwise, right? otherwise, it seems pretty feudalistic. I mean, now, what, what I noticed when I was studying the zodiacal houses, and there seemed to be a pattern, is that the Enchiites and Enolites somehow came up with an agreement that they would, they would alternate roles at the Lord of the Command rank of 50 on the Anunnaki Council. So you get an Enolite, meaning you got... Ninurta or Nanarsin or Isker Adad or one of his kids and they'd have to be an offspring of him and his half sister to be in line to rule or you got Enki and his offspring and there were several of them okay he, he had 10 kids himself on the, on Atlantis that he made kings Enki did so anyway so all of a sudden you see this ping-ponging effect back and forth so you could find if you could find one place in the zodiacal house where you knew who was in charge then, um, from that point forward, each zodiacal house, you could kind of, well, you know, does it seem to be following the positive, negative, positive, negative that you see in the zodiacal wheel? It seems to. So Pisces was a negative polarity cycle. That means an enolite was in charge. Does that make sense to me? So this is kind of a simple theory, but I started checking it out. It seems to work. So at the end of Pisces, when you enter Aquarius, it was pretty clear to me you're going to see another Anunnaki council change. So about every 2,160 years to expect that. And we're and we're seeing that exactly. Yeah, yeah, Gerald. For me, uh, well, this is questions for everybody. This is for the audience to voice this general question. But I mean, how do we cope with the thousand years of deceptive history? For me, I always seek the truth, Gerald. I, I I know I have to sift through a lot of BS and I have to sift through a lot of manipulation and sift through a lot of deception <clears throat> or misdirection or disinformation to get to where I have to go. But I eventually I always believe that the truth will percolate to the top if you seek it long enough and i think that's my coping behavior but is that is that what we've got to do is that we've got to raise the awareness is that how we cope with this thousands of years of deception well I, if you remember rene descartes he was in his this mm. philosopher he uh, decided he was going to cast off everything he believed and then start over and listen and, and anything he gleaned or learned he wanted to do it of his own accord without taking on the authority of someone else. I, that's a great mind experiment, but it's probably not reality because when you're young and you're and vulnerable, how could you be of the consciousness to do that? <laughs> you know, so, yeah. so you're already too far gone. So what I tried to do is you can look at people generically and say, well, people have beliefs and they generally use them to establish a mental framework for dealing with the range of issues that get thrown at them in this life and, and the penultimate one is there is they're trying to establish beliefs that lead to meaning they want to know that they're here for a reason why are they here what's their purpose and that's why this these these questions about the Sumerian origin are so important because when you find out exactly what Anu told Ningshida Thoth our teacher what he told him what to do to teach us and what our lot was in this life it makes a lot more sense and, and all of a sudden everybody's on the same page and there isn't this warring okay so how do you how do you cope? Well, what I generally try to do is, like you, seek the truth. Of course, I've got my belief systems, but when I find that uh, they get confronted, I generally try to view the belief as a stopping place in a Socratic dialogue. It's the best information I have at the time, given somebody was supposedly telling me the truth. Well, when you find out everything that you have is, is a lie, at this point, the only way out of this this spell, this <laughs> this trap in your head is to trust your feelings. You've got to you've got to go back to the, the the gut primitive intelligence that you have as part of your reptilian system that you can tell the difference between truth and false, and it's based on how you feel. It's yeah. it's not in your head, so you're going to have to read and look at this stuff yourself. And it when it resonates true with you, and you ignore it, then you're doing it at your own peril. But if you, but if you pay attention to the feeling of truth, it will lead you to the right place. So mm -hmm. is that a coping mechanism? No. Is it uncomfortable to cast off everything and, and, and wrestle with it? It takes years, actually, for me to, to untangle some of the, the beliefs that I still had that, it, that were based on all these lies. But what it's... Were you shocked in a way, Gerald, when you kind of had this discovery process? I'm, I'm sure there was a there was a mainstream academia that you followed. I did too. I mean, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I I was very screwed. Listen, I had a BS filter, pretty thick, and I took years. <laughs> I took years before I even talked to anybody about the theory, and I also spent a lot of time 
taking the data and corroborating it and doing my homework. So when you see the, the genealogy table that, I, that we've just completed, I'm about to make it public, um, you'll see the, the amount of time I spent putting the names together and connecting the dots. And it was, it was you know, it was kind of a fun hobby for me, to be honest with you. Here I was. Go ahead. Sorry, I have to tell you, do me a favor, John. Mention your website for the listeners, because uh, I'll, I'll just otherwise I'll just keep talking. I just just oh, so people it, can follow along. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so my website is GeraldClark77.com, and on there, uh, G E R A L D C L A R K, 77.com, and on there um, there are links to my Facebook page. It's Gerald Hyphen Clark, and my YouTube channel, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so. Follow the links and check it out. And then, uh, my book and my wife's book, uh, Meatless Mainstays for Modern Man, is available or available on Am Amazon. And my book is The Anunnaki of Nibiru. So if you just yeah. if you just search for my name in Amazon, it comes right up. Anyway, yeah. uh, uh, so so we, so as far as that goes, this, this this deceptive history, I think it's if you come forward in time now, realizing that multiple governments mm -hmm. have have disclosed what they know about alien presence on this planet, including Canada and Mexico and several others. You know, it's about time that we face the fact that we're not alone in this universe and that there are other beings that are out there kind of watching us in quarantine to determine whether we're even capable of cooperating on a scale where we could be galactic partners. And I'm telling you, if I was looking in from the outside right now, no. I mean, imagine, imagine right now. You know, as far as I'm concerned, in between the zodiacal houses, when they change, and by the way, the next zodiacal cycle, based on who Enki was was uh, paired up with, with half-sisters and, and, and lineage that were in the right place to rule, it is my professional opinion, from all I've done, and I've said this multiple times, that the next person who's in line to rule was mankind's teacher, and that was Ningshida. Okay, so he also was known as in the Levantine is Jehoshua, and so he was the one who did the Trojan horse trick in the Levantine to give mankind access to higher consciousness so that Enlil could stop suppressing them as primitive worker slaves. So he was always planned, to, he was always our teacher and our ticket the way out. So understanding that also helps you understand what the Caduceus really means uh, as a transformative symbol relative to energy and matter. So, um, did we do enough on uh, the deceptive history and whose roles were played? Do you, so, okay. So, yeah, for sure. You know, where we are today, I mean, we have vicious programs. you got Big Pharma, Monsanto. I want to talk about some modern stuff too, Gerald, and tie it in because we are being manipulated as a race. We are facing imminent threat as, uh, I mean, just the general public um, from all sorts of things, everything from fluoride to you know, genetics to, you know, are, are we going to be wiped out by our own, you know, our own cousins like? Well, it, you know, there's, there's a, and you've, you've probably heard me say this on a couple other shows, based on the timing in between the Zodiac, whenever there's a house change, there's usually a little grace period for the powers that be that were in charge to, I don't know, get their, get their culling to, you know, it's like a vote and they take time to tally up who belongs to who and they, they get to see which one is pursuing um, light and which one's pursuing dark. It's a really odd kind of judgment that seems to happen, especially when the, <clears throat> it seems to happen, not every zodiacal house, but it seems to happen, or potentially it does, but it seems to especially happen, or there's a special event that happens when the procession of the equinox goes around a full cycle. So it just so happens we're at that point in time now. So all of a sudden we're approaching a new age of Aquarius, and also we've, we've according to Mayans and 2012 or 2013, depending on who you listen to, at winter solstice, we just made a full cycle around the procession of the equinox. Mm -hmm. So that was a 26,000 great year cycle. Well, every time that happens, according to the writings that I've read, there's usually an opportunity for a great ascendancy and a great culling at the same time. And I, I truly believe that's what's happening right now. And I really think, you know, everybody watched the Mayan calendar come and go and didn't really you know, get, get anything out of it. Well, nothing really happened, you know. It was a false alarm. Well, I don't think so at all. And it has to do with our exposure to energy and the awakening of our consciousness. So those that are paying attention to that and ready to graduate from the Earth simulator get an opportunity at that point. So, mm. so as far as these roles that FDA, Big Pharma, and Monsanto are playing, listen, all aspects of the government, especially in the United States, given who landed there and who's in control, 
there's a negative culling going on and it's being pushed to the max so every everything you eat everything you breathe everything you touch you're going to be faced with a choice of, and some of it's not even free will this is where i get disturbed such that uh you choose wrong and you're going down you'll end up with cancer you'll end up with a you know a tumor from some electromagnetic frequency you didn't know about who knows sure. you know so so there's a and so now you've got the proof that the fda is being puppeteered by big pharma and Monsanto's in, in bed with the government in terms of paying uh, whether a farmer grows this crop or that in, in order to regulate the food supply so they had a way in to c contaminate everything. It's really quite awful. Um, I mean, the genetic modification, you would it sounds like a good thing, but if you do a study and it shows that it's destroying the, the, the consumers of that product, uh, you should stop. <laughs> but the problem with the seed is once you've once you've sown it, it's hard to stop it. You know, ten years ago, Gerald, I I, I started. Don't ask me why. I, I I just got conscious of reading the labels and looking for just basic products where it was just basic foods. None of these e numbers. I think I was probably looking for e numbers, and then I started looking into things. You know, I I now I research where my fruits come from, what countries are the countries coming from for the fruits and, and, and what pesticides they have in those countries and I try to limit the damage of the food going into my body. Inevitably, you know, there will be fluoride in the pesticides, there will be fluoride getting in somehow. I can only limit the, 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 the crap that goes into my body, even no matter how healthy can I am. Particularly, on what I'm looking forward to doing a show with your wife, Krista. Oh, yeah, yeah I, wanted to, I wanted to put a plug in. Last night, actually, we stayed up a little late and she just put out a video on her YouTube channel and I'll get it to you that uh, we went we did exactly that I finally pinned her down I wanted to, wanted to find out you know what kind of stuff she could disclose about her or vegan path and what she's found out about Monsanto and 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 the effects of different diets and so forth and she did a really great job so it, we, we put it out yesterday it's really you know it's bang up with pictures and everything so it's really fun so uh, well, I'll put, I'll put that in the YouTube description for this show. Yeah, well, I'll get you connected People to that. If you're listening live, <laughs> they'll be able to check it out on YouTube. Well, she, well, she may want to go ahead and do another show with you to get a different audience over there. So I'll, I'll definitely connect Absolutely. you with that. I, okay. I would love that because this ties in nicely. And, you know, it, there is a culling going on. We know that they have it on the Georgia Guidestones. They want the population near the 500 million. They'll probably go keep going. But Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. So now let's make that real for a second. Let's yeah. go back to the Atrahasis. Knowing that Enlil, his symbol of the eagle, was introducing disease, a disease, doing this, cutting off the food, the water. He's willing to wipe you out, people. No yeah. questions asked. All you got to do is sign up to his agenda, and he'll willingly wipe you out. But that's the crazy part about this whole <laughs> this whole simulator that we're in. So if he was doing it in if he was doing it in Africa and Mesopotamia before, and he's still here. And his symbols showing up at governments all over the world. Guess what? It's negative culling time, and it's not a joke. It's not a joke. <laughs> so, so these big players that show up, these three-letter agencies, typically that are controlled by the government. I mean, come on. Look what's going on with our DHS, for instance. Not only just what's going in your body, but our sovereignty, our way of life. Everything is being the carpet is being pulled out from under people. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think that one of the things I tried to do was buy food without MSG in it, Gerald. And I, and, and it's nearly, it's not impossible now. You yeah, know? And I, actually, yeah. I, I cook all my sauces from scratch now, Gerald. I, I just learned to do it. And yeah, I, we do a lot of that as well. I think, uh, I think you'd have a great show with Krista. So uh, yeah. all, all, the, all the different things that are being done to affect your health. Look, listen, your body is your temple. And if, you're, if your temple is screwed up, either structurally or... Um, or musculoskeletally or, or genetically, listen, you're going to have a much harder time getting your human antenna to work so you can plug into the frequencies that, that light you up and wake you up. And that's part of the ascendancy. You know, I'm not sure if we're going to talk much about energy matter. I did a bunch of it in my book. The energy matter you did talk about in your book. Let's, let's just jump in there for a second. Okay, I love, okay. I, I love the chakra systems as nodes of wavelengths. This is the electrical engineering, Gerald, coming out. I actually love this. It was beautifully described. Oh, well, thank you. Well, you know, actually... Let's talk a bit about that. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, we stepped on no, each yeah, other. Yeah, you have the equation for the energy in the human body. I won't give it. It's in the book, but it's the way you broke it down, and it just makes so much sense that there's each frequency is a frequency of light. That's why we have these chakra colors and chakra nodal points. That's exactly right, because all you got to do is know that the speed of light equals the wavelength times the frequency, and the wavelength is the color, 
<laughs> and so if you take the speed of light, divide by the frequency, you get the color. So it, it, the, yeah, the interesting part to me is that the chakra system introduced to us from India and, and uh, ancient cultures knew that. They knew the different colors of the chakra. And even more amazing is they knew that it was the color of the rainbow, which is really, imagine Enki designing us and he decided to make these wavelengths at these ganglion nerve uh, nodes along your central conductor co coincide with the division of visible light. Mm. I did a master's in research sciences society. Uh, I was actually going to go and do uh, something else, a PhD in physics, and I never did. I just took a master's in research, and, and, I, and I chose to do Babylonian Sumerian cylinder seals. And I was studying them from an engineering perspective and a cultural perspective, but I soon realized, Gerald, that these guys were using all these different colored crystals. They have, I, I, maybe they were picking the energy of the crystals. I don't know, but it's like they carved these cylinder seals, Gerald. Now, these cylinder seals are, are, are reverse and bust so that when you roll them into clay, there's a raised bump surface. I'm sure you know this. Right. I saw, but, I saw a little special on one of those recently, and they could not figure out how they had done this image in reverse at such yeah. granular detail. Yeah, I mean, you need to see a microscope. Sometimes you can't even see the image till it's rolled in the clay, <laughs> you know. And it's what they carved them. It's like sometimes they use soft tone, like a calcite, anites and diorites and, and crystals and rock crystals. Sometimes they're multicolored uh, chalcedonies that you can't even see the image. It, it's the worst substance to carve into, Gerald. Yet they have this technology to do it. And not only that, I, I think they chose the subject, uh, the, these crystals for their energy or, you know, and of course they wore them around the neck as well, like pendants. So I, I somehow that they they the 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 material for its energy or its. Well, there's a, there's an amazing story in some of the work I was reading, some of it from Sitchin, where uh, Marduk had been holed up inside uh, the Giza pyramid, where he was put put into exile for asserting his his uh, rulership 24 years too early. He um, became the uh, he he uh, he got the rank of 50 about 2000 BCE and took it away from Enlil. Well, in, in part of getting there, he, uh, he, he had a lot of problems. <laughs> but uh, one of the accounts, he, um, Ninurta actually went into the pyramid, the Giza pyramid, and took out several crystals that they were using for, I think they were using them for, yeah, they were using uh, crystals apparently for communication and also for um, sound healing uh, effects inside the pyramid. So that was really interesting. But there was an account where Ninurta went out and took them out and... Uh, and seem to affect their bond heaven earth communication so that, that that was interesting and and the idea of that they did use crystals a lot and they knew a lot about energy and matter that we don't know wow wow yeah so uh so uh let's see so at that point um we start to get the idea that these people that are building these amazing temples I mean, like the, the 52 degree angle on some of the ziggurat temples in Mesopotamia matched the ones that were in the Yucatan, which had Thoth's signature all over. That was his number, 52. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, so all of a sudden you start uh, looking around currently exopolitically in the world, go, well, if they're still here and they're, if they're marionetting us to cull the population, do this, produce their technology, build their underground cities, everything else that we've done, um, What's what's the role of these uh, these secret societies and, and, and yeah, how yeah. are how are the Illuminati and the Masons playing their role in this new world order? Okay, so I'm glad, so, I'm glad you brought that up. I just come back from Austria, as you know, uh, Gerald with Klaus Donner, and uh, I mean that place is Illuminati central. There's Masonic stuff everywhere there. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in your face. There's pentagons and. You know the causeways, everything in the city. I've met the skull and bones uh, societies there. Everything is built into the churches from like it's 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 frightening. It's right, right. Frightening. Well, I want to lay something out before we get started. Imagine that the the greatest deception of all is taking your creator and making him out to be some some evil destroyer. Okay, mm -hmm. Enlil made sure that happened through the Catholic Church all the way all the way through time. From the time that the Catholic Church over to, became a reality under Constantine till now, uh, that that infrastructure has been in place to shut people up and maintain control. Okay, so secret societies were formed uh, way back in Babylon under the royal dragon courts, under Marduk and, and others, um, to keep secrets. So you have to realize the Enlites and the Enkites were absolutely at war. And here they were in Babylon, in the in the Mesopotamian region, in Enlil's territory, when the, all those wars took place. 
So the 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 old secret societies had had a place to carry knowledge whenever somebody was trying to rout you. <laughs> okay, so it turned out that the Illuminati showed up. Um, I guess in 1776 in Europe, and of course it was uh, in Bavaria, and this was a time when the Catholic Church was still um, killing people for talking about the, the Earth not being at the you know at the center of the solar system, and, and so on and so forth. I give you Isaac Newton, for instance. Okay, so the the Masons also though all go all the way back to Babylon, as far as I'm concerned, and they have a lineage that progresses forward through the Knights Templar and and uh, and so on and so forth. But um, what? So you have to ask yourself, why did, did the Illuminati in Europe all of a sudden infiltrate the Masons? And the and the, the Church was absolutely opposed to people being part of the Masonic Order. Well, you know, so this was their way of trying to destroy the Masons. Well, the original Masonic Charter appears to have been something that I would generally call influenced by Enki. Okay, the ability to use scientific knowledge to cut stone, stack it up really nice, and and do it in such a way where you're using sacred geometry as well. I mean, this was all in, in, incorporated into their their knowledge, even in the castles in Europe. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, so what role are they playing? Well, it's hard to tell because once they started infiltrating each other, it was hard to know um, which was which. But now, now what I see is the symbols showing up on their structure has me very confused because it looks like the Illuminati under the Catholic Church and who's worshiping Lucifer right it's they've got a Lucifer scope they've been doing their homilies at the at Easter in the last two years in Latin saying exactly that that they venerate Lucifer and so when you find out that the Illuminati is venerating Lucifer they're doing it they're part of the same gig okay and this is an Enlilite gig very very destructive so, I, as far as the Vatican's role, well, it should be pretty clear through their Jesuit order in setting up the Federal Reserve and controlling all the world's banks. They are the, so the source of banking, <laughs> in essence, and, uh, and, mm -hmm. that's, and so, you know, so they're playing the financier role. But they're also playing a religious role uh, relative to fulfilling Enwell's wishes through his prophets. And this is where Bible prophecy comes in, involving the, the uh, uh, like, the prophets Ezekiel and Daniel and also in the in the um, the teachings of Malachi when he's talking about the last pope and he counted them off and this shows up in several of the books we're at the last pope right now so that's that's very interesting so, so in my opinion right now the Vatican's playing the role of fostering a place to harbor an ancient astronaut who's a genocidal murderer who's going to declare himself God, God on the Temple Mount, just like he wrote to his prophets that he was going to do. Now listen, if they live as long as they do, what's a zodiacal house to make a little prediction like that 2,000 years? It's nothing. These, nothing, these yeah. guys, minimally, the first kings in the Sumerian kings list were serving 28,800 years on their, on their term. That's not how long they live. That's how long they serve. Now, how is that possible? I want to kind of jump back to something real quick before we talk about the Illumina and the Masons anymore. In 2009, three scientists were awarded a Nobel Prize for their research into telomeres. And this genetic research, and just real quickly, I'll just summarize it. If, if, if you can find the precursor to the, the chemical telomerase in your body, and it's in, the, in significant quantities, then your telomeres at the end of your DNA don't decay. They don't shorten. Your cell replication doesn't cause decay, which is where you come up with aging. Okay, that's what causes aging. So we, they discovered the, 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 okay, so back to the Starfire Gold. The Anunnaki knew this. They were taking Starfire Gold to prevent their aging. That's, that's on the guidance of Nin Hartzog, okay? So I, I wanted to put that to rest and then come back to, um, now so, let's come back to the current time with the New World Order thing. So on the dollar bill, you see this unfinished pyramid and the all-seeing eye. And, and I want you to keep in mind that these symbols, that are being implemented to ra bring about a new world order coincident with the change in our zodiacal house, by the way. That's no, that's no coincidence. So this, this world order, you know, if you look at it, you go, well, if it was brought about by Enki and his clan for the benefit of mankind, giving us all the technology to get rid of fossil fuels, no more health care problems, fix our genetics, wow, we, we would be living a, a utopian existence, right? Whereas if you let the other side do it, you're probably going to be living in a brave new world, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. And so, yeah. so just because they were 
Anunnaki from another planet. The religious right will tell you, well, they're all fallen angels and they're all demons. Well, apparently their personalities range just as far as ours do on this planet, everything from serial killers to saints. So um, if you're disparaging the one who genetically augmented and created you, I guess that's within your right. But uh, I don't know. <laughs> they, they venerated the creator of all, but at the same time, would you venerate somebody who was in a genetics lab today that created a chimera that had sentient consciousness would you yeah i know what you mean <laughs> i don't know i mean there's how many there's it's probably a question of perspective gerald it's a it is it is it is you know if they just created you and turned you on your on your own and you weren't capable of surviving and you just died instantly yeah mm -hmm. you'd be kind of looked at as a, a crappy creator but if you actually took care of your creation and tried to protect it and allow it to evolve to the point where you were um and did it you know, in a fair fight, then I guess, I guess I'll, you know, I'd be okay with that. I guess, I guess, I don't know. It's, it's part of, it's part of the question of whether the gate with which they gave us to ascend is wide enough. Mm -hmm. Wow. So wow. what a fascinating discussion. <laughs> isn't it fascinating? Hey, this is enlightening because you brought some new knowledge that I wasn't quite aware of. And that's why I love doing the shows, Gerald. I love doing this because, you know, I, I'm knowledgeable in a lot of the material I like in getting into a new book and doing this and uh, and coming up with new knowledge and I like the way you present the the knowledge, Gerald. It's 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 a scientific and it's a very wide spectrum that you have. Um, you know, and there's very few people that would rise to that challenge too. You need you have, need to be enthusiastic too, Gerald, as well as having the skill set. That are just um, just a little disturbed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I designed I designed electronic circuit boards and field programmable gate arrays and a, a, application specific integrated circuits and that kind of stuff. So what am I doing messing around with uh, <laughs> the Anunnaki and the origins of mankind? Well, you have to ask yourself. I don't know. It's uh, it was in my it was in my path to do this, and uh, I think I was significantly influenced by uh, Anu's appointed teacher to do that. So uh, that's the role that's the role I'm playing for now. And I don't know what role I'll be playing next. But speaking of that, speaking of role playing. Did you see the uh, Did you see the movie The Hunger Games? I haven't. No. Oh, I'm okay. A, I, I I read a book every other day, and I haven't watched. <laughs> this one, this, this one, I would this one, I'd encourage you. And also, there was another movie called The Thirteenth Floor, and then there was another one called uh, The Truman Show, and they're all kind of different takes on virtual reality or a three D environment that might be simulated. Okay, and the and the experiments that they did. Mm -hmm. So. So after reading Michael Talbot's book, uh, The Holographic Universe, I actually started considering some of this information to be more valid. In particular, when I did the energy body equation from a human, you realize we're electrical beings, and in the electromagnetic spectrum that we're in, um, there's a whole full range that we're experiencing, and only a small part about which we can perceive. 4 to 700 nanometers for our eyes, 0 to 20 kilohertz for your ears, and 0 to... 20 hertz or, or about a half hertz to 20 hertz for your brain waves okay and then whatever's going on in your chakras you know like the wavelengths and the frequency of each of those so you're having an interaction with these electromagnetic spectrum and gravity too so that being said knowing that we were talking about crystals and structures and that the majority mm -hmm. of a material item is actually free space and you have a, you know a structure based on how the protons and neutrons electrons and all the other particles do fits together well most of it's free space and electrons it's energy everything is energy and einstein's equation shows that so that being said imagine an ancient alien had the ability to create a simulator much like on the star trek holodeck in a holographic space where you know the five senses that you have You've learned what it means to touch something and say that's hard or that's solid or that's soft. Well, if everybody has that same experience, you just set a simulation parameter that establishes a common norm. How are you going to know any different if it's not if it isn't a simulation? Is what I'm asking. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Wow. You, it's the same manipulation. You are being manipulated. How do you how do the manipulated know they're manipulated if you're 100 percent successful? Well, that's where the that's where the movies were interesting, and they all had the same theme. If the if the archetypic character who's walking their their heroic journey overcomes their dark night of their soul, their fear, whatever it is, they get they find a way out of the simulator. On the 13th floor, uh, they did a simulation that they were doing the simulation and inside the, so they were a simulation they found out they were also inside of a simulation by finding a a, a a disturbance in the 
network that had been set up to establish the hologram. There was a place where it wasn't complete, and somebody told them about it. They went and saw it, and that's when their whole <laughs> uh, brains <laughs> went crazy, and they realized they were in a simulation. So, you know, it came up in Avatar and several other in the Matrix, where the idea of being able to have your energy be at some place other than in your body. I, I think after reading Robert Monroe's books, Journeys Out of the Body, and experiencing that myself for years, um, I think that's a reality. So I think we're in a material simulator where spiritual beings have this crazy material experience, and it's all designed to evolve our consciousness. So we're ready for the next encounter with our galactic neighbors when we get out of quarantine. I really think that's what's going on. And the culling that's going on right now is absolute. Listen, you're not you're not kidding about the Georgia Guidestones. They have no qualms whatsoever about taking this material form and eliminating it and coalescing the energy into something that's going to be more beneficial to them. Because energy is never destroyed. It's it's only change of state. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I just want to throw this one in, Gerald, uh, off topic, uh, back to uh, Nibiru. Do you think the 1983 Eris satellite picked it up? Do you think that was a definite uh, picking up Nibiru on the radar? Well, um, I did a video on my uh, website, and I posted it, where Zechariah Sitchin uh, went to Washington, D.C., and he sat down after having sent him his book, The Twelfth Planet, in 1976 when he wrote it. He wrote the, he gave it, sent it to him later. This was 83, like you said. He sat in his office in Washington, D.C. and went back and forth. And I have it on video of Harrington telling him, here's my chart, here's yours. And they, he said, I absolutely agree with you that it was. So there's no question in my mind that the, the chief of the Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C. Um, had the IRAS data. He commissioned it because he did it based on Zacharias Hitchens' uh, uh, knowledge and also the fact that they were seeing perturbations at Pluto and Neptune, and they couldn't understand what was large enough that was causing that. Yeah, the perturbations would have to be like a failed second sun in a red dwarf or something like that at that at that distance. Yeah, you know, there's other things that, uh, you know, I've, I've read all those accounts, but I'm also reconciling the fact that there are up to 20 alien species on this planet, according to Paul Hellyer from Canada. So, so there's been a lot of interaction going on. They probably fight among each other for vying over the Earth's resources. Um, I don't think that's yeah. changed. So... Uh, so it, it becomes hard to know about who's who and where they landed. But uh, that's probably what's going to show up in my next book. Uh, I'm writing another book called um, The Seventh Planet, Mercury Rising. That's the title. Wow, beautiful. Nice <laughs> Do you do into astrology at all, uh, off topic? Do you look into astrology? At well, all? I went through this phase where I did, and I got this book. Uh, I'm going to reach over and grab it right now. It's by a guy named Kevin Burke, uh, Understanding the birth chart and a comprehensive guide to classical classical interpretation it's pretty well written and I actually went out and got the software and played with it for a while and as a bottom the bottom line for me with astrology was if you think about it in terms of a a planet's effect on the resultant electromagnetic spectrum that occurs on your planet um, this this is where it makes sense to me. So if you put the moon in between the sun and the earth, you're going to get a different amount of radiation striking our ionosphere than you would if you hadn't. So all of a sudden now you start going, wow, there, these planets have energy interactions with them. And if you think about the true definition of what gravity is, which has not been <laughs> disclosed, gravity has to do with an expansion fork, and it's based on the geometry of the planet. And it also perfectly uh, is described in a book called uh, The Final Theory by McCutcheon. I think you'd really enjoy that if you like physics, by the way. The Final Theory by McCutcheon. His very first chapter is all completely on gravity, and when he's walking you through some of the stuff that was taught to you in, um, phys in physics, especially mechanics when you started out, and as you move forward with him, you're going to realize uh, you were either deceived intentionally or we just truly didn't know. I think it was probably the former so <laughs> that being said um, it's 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 an interesting thing to recognize the, the extent to which we could be in this simulator so uh, again I want you to go back and, and see uh, Hunger Games to, to see the effect of the constructs that would come about with a new world order that we're going to see right now especially if an Enolite is bringing it about now like just to finish that, that thought before I get way too off base the New World Order you're seeing right now under the Enlil lights that's being imposed with Apollo at the helm of the – and Enlil, his, the, the father and son, Zeus and Apollo, okay, they're the ones that are implementing that part. 
contrary to that was what we had in Atlantis under Enki. And so Washington, D.C. was supposed to be a place where the new Atlantis rose, not a new world order of a tyrannical beatdown. So once again, the, the negative forces are smearing the positive forces, trying to create a false structure. When the new one does come, that's what gives me hope. I think the carpet will be pulled out from under all this crap that's going on right now. You know, subjugating borders and all the things that are happening. So, and I think that's going to be headed by Enki and his son, Nishida. So that would be Poseidon and Hermes. <laughs> so it's really funny to me. I never gave any credence at all to the Greek god thing and never studied Greek mythology much. So I came at it from Samaria and had to follow it through to the point where Western culture starts sure. teaching about it. It's really funny. But, you know, it's still taught to us as a, as a myth today. Now, let me ask. Uh, I want to do some... Go ahead. Sorry, I want to do some justice. Are you speaking at anywhere, a conference anywhere? Or do you do conferences? Do you want to give a plug out for anything you're doing this year? Well, I, I actually... I, I, I actually do do conferences, and I've done a couple of private ones. Uh, I, was, I was supposed to be a contact in the desert this year, and I had a, another one scheduled in June in San Diego. Um, for some reason right now, I think my path is such that I can reach more people over the Internet than I can in person. As much as I want to confer and do that, uh, there may be a time this year that I allocate some time to do that, and uh, maybe we'll do it together. <laughs> but Yeah, for sure. Yeah, but right now – yeah, yeah, right now. We're over this part of yeah, well, right now, just uh, just so you know where I'm at, uh, I've just taken my book and converted it to, and had it proofed in Spanish. So it's going to be coming out. There's so many people in the world that speak Spanish that want that, and I've also Best. yeah, and I'm yeah. also targeting to get it out in Russian too right now because uh, I wow. think I think that's very important. Wow, have you got a Russian translator? Um, not yet. Wow. I actually, I actually was approached by a, a publisher that was going to do the translation, but it, you know, I actually like to do things locally and then farm out uh, responsibilities later. So, yeah, Gerald, I'm going to wrap it up with that because I could go on for another hour or two, and uh, you know, we're at the end of the show. You know, what a fascinating guy you are. I love your research, I really do, and you know, keep going. I look forward to. Uh, I look forward to your enthusiastic approach again on the se on the next book, like, and uh, I just I just love it. I love the spectrum that you have, Gerald. You know, and there's few out there to have that spectrum and the enthusiasm. So, well, J I James, I again, again give us your, sorry, just give us out your website and you can wrap it up yourself, Gerald. Okay, it's GeraldClark77.com, and I want to say to you, James, thanks for being so patient with uh, some of the networking problems we've had to get this pulled off. Um, your enthusiasm uh, made me want to stick it out and get through all the issues so uh i look forward to seeing uh, your posting and i'll do one as well and uh, uh i hope sure. we'll have i hope we'll uh, have a chance to do another interview soon oh for sure brother for sure we'll wrap it up and thank you for your time tonight Jim. and thank you have a good night